We're going to get started now. My name is Victor Hugh, and uh, I'm the co-founder and managing director for Exceed Capital, an investment firm that focuses on growth stage companies in the human capital sector globally. And uh, I'm very pleased to welcome you this afternoon to this panel that is entitled, What Are Investors Looking For uh, in the Next Billion Dollar Company? The uh, commitment of capital to the uh, education sector is um, something that's been around uh, for as long as, as people and institutions have been around. But uh, the development of venture capital as an asset class uh, to support uh, ventures in the education space, I would say, is a very, very new development overall. Um, you can witness that in part by the fact that uh, the institutions represented by these leading investors here on the stage um, have all just been around generally for um, you know single digit number of years. Uh, and, and we ourselves actually were just founded in the last few months. Um, the, uh, uh, nonetheless, it's a very, very exciting time to be deploying capital uh, in venture and in growth stage companies in the sector on a global basis. Entrepreneurship, uh, I believe, is at its highest level than it's ever been, and it's, it's growing on a global basis. Uh, the s factors for success, though, uh, are quite distinct. Uh, I would say, in the, uh, the sector, uh, and certainly differ quite a bit from uh, region to region, as well as from subsector to subsector. Uh, and that's something we'd like to unpack a little bit uh, in our discussion today. Uh, so uh, without further ado, I will um, uh, ask the, the panelists really to introduce themselves uh, in the context of answering this question, which is, um, Tell us about your, your why, your reason for uh, doing what you're doing, uh, why your firm exists, why now is the, a good time to be doing what you're doing, and uh, what your personal connection is uh, to the business of investing in education. Uh, and I'm going to start all the way at the, uh, the end there with uh, Lulua. Thank you, Victor. Um, so my name is Lulu Abakar. I'm uh, a founding partner at uh, Chrome Advisory. And the, the why really is the reason behind founding Chrome Advisory um, uh, a year or so ago. Um, we are a boutique financial advisory firm uh, based in Saudi Arabia that uh, uh, does investment advisory uh, for the venture capital um, uh, industry in Saudi for various stakeholders in the venture capital industry. So uh, all the way from uh, funds to angel investors to private investors, um, all the way to startups, and we also are involved with the government of Saudi Arabia on uh, uh, several interesting projects to kickstart uh, the uh, uh, venture capital ecosystem and uh, really to connect the dots um, in that uh, um, in that field. Um, uh, we um, uh, we find that um, the why why now and and why not before why is everybody single digit old is um, in our part of the world is largely top down driven. Um, uh, the um, uh, the traditional asset classes are no longer yielding uh, the returns that they uh, would normally yield. So um, people have focused uh, or shifted their focus on to something more exciting, which uh, uh, the their governments and their leaders are also uh, counting very heavily on diversifying from the oil based economy into uh, a more diversified economy and the diversification seems to focus seems to be coming from uh, the uh, SME sector and therefore uh, the, the the focus on on startups. Amit Patel and I'm with Owl Ventures. We're a uh, San Francisco based uh, education technology focused venture capital fund. Uh, we primarily invest at the Series A and Series B stage. Uh, we're usually leading those rounds that we're investing in. Uh, we have 19 portfolio companies that we've invested in. Um, in terms of the why, uh, I would say on a personal note, uh, why education, uh, I saw the impact that it had on my father uh, when he did uh, immigrate from India to the United States. and. He wouldn't have been able to do what he had done had it not been for education. And so uh, being connected to the space has been something that I've 
uh, done actually for over a decade before joining the team at OWL. And why now? I think it's, you know, uh, different reasons depending on what sector of education you're looking at, but I'll, I'll say why now, for example, in the K-12 sector is you finally have the infrastructure there for software companies to actually scale. Schools are actually starting to get access to high-speed broadband internet. That's not just happening in the United States, that's happening kind of around the world. And uh, devices like the Chromebook, uh, which are $120, are starting to become cheaper than textbooks in, in some countries. And so uh, you're starting to get that uh, high-speed broadband internet connection as well as the, the uh, devices in the student's hands so you can actually sell and scale uh, software solutions in schools. Hi everyone, uh, my name is Bikrama. I'm a managing director at Central Square Foundation. Uh, we're, uh, we, we work on school system education reform and uh, we do this through the tools of venture philanthropy, uh, which is early stage grant making, uh, research and uh, government engagement. Uh, I think on, on why we do this work, I think you know the ed system, school ed system in India is facing uh, deep challenges uh, at several different stages. Uh, and we believe that through this approach of uh, innovation to policy that we, that we pursue, uh, we can sort of play a catalytic role in helping sort of focus the system sh more sharply towards learning and really uh, moving the needle uh, at the system level. Uh, why now on, and you know, maybe even just giving a quick sense of what I would like to bring into this panel. Uh, we, uh, we look at EdTech very much from a philanthropy lens on what role can really philanthropy play in creating pathways to scale for EdTech products. And, uh, and, and I think I'll uh, echo, uh, you know, what you just said that I think we're at a stage even in India now where and I'll share some numbers later, but where hardware penetration connectivity is moving to a stage where we could actually leapfrog and really uh, EdTech could really, really get um, uh, distribution and dissemination to a large number of beneficiaries. Hi everyone, I'm Jennifer Carolyn and I'm co-founder of Reach Capital. We're an early stage education technology fund um, based in Palo Alto, uh, founded in 2011. We've invested in about 55 uh, startups. Um, why now? I, uh, it comes uh, from a personal place for me. I'm a former classroom teacher. I taught in the classroom for seven years. And as a teacher, I thought it was one of the toughest jobs ever. And I had some of the, the very worst uh, software available for to me as a teacher. So I really set out to um, start a fund that would uh, invest in consumer-like, really high-quality uh, software for teachers because their job is so important, so complex, and, and, and they don't have very good tools to do it. Matt Greenfield, um, managing partner of Rethink Education, which invests primarily in A and B rounds, but also in C stage companies and uh, growth stage companies on occasion. Um, I am a former college literature professor. I have a PhD in English from Yale. Um, I stumbled into this um, wonderful job through a series of accidents, one of which was meeting the college roommate and fellow Rhodes Scholar of one of my um, grad school classmates who um, started a business called Wireless Generation. I ended up rounding up a group of angels to invest, and um, that company was acquired for $400 million, which was eye-opening. Uh, another was running into an autism specialist who was trying to sell a professional development curriculum for teaching autistic children in the form of a stack of paper. I said, I think this should be a software company, and I wrote a business plan, and then we actually gave it to Wireless Generation, but annoyingly, they wouldn't do anything with it, so then I went looking for um, a CEO, briefly considered running it myself, realized swiftly that, that, that I didn't have the right skill set, and found two entrepreneurs who started what was initially called Rethink Autism, just hit $20 million in ARR, is profitable, is helping tens of thousands of kids with special needs, and also, this is an important point about all of our companies, it's gathering a totally unprecedented data set. If you look at the studies of autism by Ivor Lobos, they're persuasive, but they involve 48 kids or 60 kids, and they involve some self-reporting. And so our companies are opening up entirely new research possibilities, a new map of the mind. 
Thanks, everybody. So um, maybe to, to start with uh, uh, the, the general and the broad, I'll, I'll go to, uh, to Jennifer, uh, who I think amongst us invest at the earliest stages. Now, venture capitalists always talk about uh, you know, investing in, uh, in a big market, in a great team, uh, and in an innovative and powerful business model. I'm sure that is true still for, for you and for all of us who invest. What would you say uh, would be any additional overlays or framings in terms of how you think about uh, companies specifically in the education context? You know, what is your thesis for value creation that maybe goes beyond you know, these first pillars uh, uh, and, and uh, r really help us think through you know, your thought process, your, uh, your theses uh, around this sector? Sure. So we invest uh, at the earliest stages, as you said, and so oftentimes we're looking at companies, entrepreneurs that are pitching ideas that haven't yet launched. They are in development or sometimes they're just an idea um, at that phase. And so we, uh, it's, it's a very humbling job, I have to say. So we, we see 30 to 40 companies per week that are coming inbound to us and we inevitably miss a lot of great companies um, that you know, there's always companies, a whole, we have a whole like anti-portfolio, a set of companies we wish we had invested in and passed on. So at the, the earliest stages, we are really making a, a bet on the team, on the entrepreneur itself, and we're looking for somebody that is very authentically driven to solve this problem. So somebody who ideally has experienced this problem firsthand and is trying to um, solve their own, their own uh, scratch their own itch, as we, as we say. So, uh, for example, there was a, a company that we invested in called um, No Red Inc. The founder is Jeff Scheuer. He's a teacher uh, out from a high school in Chicago, actually the, the high school that I attended, mm. and he, an English teacher. And he wanted to create a software, as I was describing before, t uh, that he had no software available for this to help teach grammar. And he just created it on the side and in the summer, uh, and then he uh, launched it on his own and then eventually uh, launch this company, Quit Teaching. But that's a great example of somebody who is authentically trying to solve their own problem. So I really look for like authenticity of purpose. That, that really matters, matters to me. And we say we, we look for missionaries, not mercenaries. So not people that are c coming into the, the sector to, to make a, a bunch of money. Um, this is a hard sector to make money. <laughs> Matt, Matt describes some, some ways he has done it, but it's hard. And so you really have to be purpose driven. So I think that and maybe lean, we look for lean teams, teams that are using a lean startup methodology and are not sort of overcapitalized. Important for us too. Got it. Uh, Lu, Lu, can you bring in a little bit of um, you know, the emerging markets context to some of what, what Jennifer just talked about? Sort of what, what have you seen in terms of uh, the companies who have raised capital successfully in the region that you cover uh, out in the Middle East and what, what uh, financiers have been looking for there? Um, uh, well, just a continuation, and definitely agree with everything that Jennifer said, but you have to look at it from a different perspective. It's the perspective of the local investor who has still, you know, to get into the mindset and the framework of understanding the the sustainability aspect of bringing an ed tech asset into your portfolio. Uh, so they, they, they totally understand, I mean, they're starting to get the sustainability aspect. They're starting to get over the long-term hurdle, as in this is not an overnight play. This is, um, you know, this is a, a, a marathon rather than a sprint. Um, and this is very important for the local investor mindset because they're always, they always have this short to medium term kind of uh, uh, um, uh, horizon ahead of them in, in other asset classes. Um, what they can't, what they're having difficulty getting their minds around, and, and it, it is the hurdle that Jennifer talked about, which is um, uh, the, the, the monetization of it and, and the business model really. And, and um, how uh, to, to think about the, the, the conversion rates and to successfully convert from uh, uh, having uh, uh, users to having pay, paying users and, and and what finally what is the the, the scalability of it all so um, I'll give an example for um, I think what 
What truly attracted, uh, attracted investors about this particular example, as I'm going to give, is the huge gap uh, or need that um, is being addressed. So uh, just to give a background, um, the Arab world is um, 500 million people strong, so it's a half a billion people. Everybody speaks the same language or a variation of the same language. However, only 2% of online content is available in Arabic. So you can understand that there's a huge um, gap here that needs to be covered. So um, uh, there are a lot of solutions that are trying to chase that gap all the way from content creation to solving the, 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 the big problem of, of translation and uh, content enrichment and so forth. Um, uh, this uh, uh, company started, uh, started two, eight years ago by two mums who uh, realized that uh, their children are no longer speaking Arabic amongst them. And she felt that this, they felt that this was sad for them and the future of the, the Arab world. So they worked on, first of all, video content, and then they turned that into an online uh, uh, literacy um, uh, platform uh, to teach Arabic. Uh, they started with a few thousand uh, students now. Um, they are up to 75,000 students, uh, five countries around the Arab world. They're, ra they're raising their series uh, B at this point in time. They're called Little Thinking Minds, and they have been invested in um, by a variety of uh, angel uh, investors, and uh, also now they are being considered by a big fund in the region. This is significant not only because it's ed tech, but also because they are female investors, and female investors get very, f very low traction, um, I think, in VC in general, but in this part of the world in particular. Got it. So cultural linguistic connections um, that really have, have helped to um, uh, drive that investment thesis. Let, what if we went to a specific country and just let's talk about India for a little bit, uh, Bikrama. You know, how, how would you uh, describe the state of ed tech in India? You know, from a, a distance, you know, the, the demographics of the country uh, seem incredibly compelling, um, incredibly young, population, fast-growing, humongous need, uh, it would seem, for uh, great products and services in this particular segment. At the same time, um, it does seem like few companies have really broken out and uh, achieved uh, the, the, the type of success that you've seen in other markets. So can you talk a to us a little bit about that particular market You know, in, in light of some of the issues that have just been raised? Sure. Uh, so I think like you called out, uh, whenever we think of India, we think of scale. I mean, I'll throw some numbers out. 1.32 billion people, 54% of the population under the age of 25, uh, the largest school system in the world, 251 million children, uh, 1.53 million schools. Uh, now, if let me zoom in on EdTech. You know, there's been, uh, in the last five years, I would say, a lot of innovation around EdTech. There's some estimated to be some 600 EdTech companies in India largely innovating um, uh, for the high and middle income, middle and high income schools and parents, largely B2C models, and that's where the paying payer capacity today exists, so that's where the innovation is happening there. I think an, uh, an industry report is estimated that the, the industry will size and the sales will grow to uh, two billion, grow eightfold to two billion by 2021. Uh, so, you know, from an uh, industry perspective, uh, I think there still is a skepticism, but uh, uh, we do see uh, some companies now that sort of are, you know, have uh, overcome some of the inherent challenges when you go after the mid and high income segment in a, of a very fragmented market and you go direct to parents. And I, you may have all heard of Baiju's, um, you know, it's got all nearly a billion dollar valuation. And uh, But I don't know if you want me to talk about it now, but... I mean, we, at least from a philanthropy impact lens, we don't, we, you know, a lot of these ed tech companies today are not reaching the mass market. Uh, they're not reaching the children, uh, you know, at, at the most need. And there's valid reasons for that. Uh, you know, the challenges on hardware, on connectivity, uh, and uh, payer capacity doesn't exist. The affordable private school segment is completely fragmented. Uh, but, uh, but, you know, I mean, let me throw, I mean, if I throw some numbers at you, you know, we genuinely believe that. Uh, you know, ed tech could be a game, uh, game changer, you know, in the next decade. And uh, it could, um, you know, really, really transform how children learn. And, you know, the two use cases we really are optimistic about is teachers and students. 
and uh, and you know if you just and even if the, even these structural barriers i know which uh, which lend which make us skeptical so you know take hardware uh, mobile phone penetration in india is go is estimated to go up from 290 million to 400 million by 2021 Mo connectivity uh, is is estimated to go there are 400 million people who have internet connectivity today is estimated to go up to 700 million now you know even let me give you a statistic on rural india so there was a survey done recently among 14 to 18 year olds uh, and, and these are children and some 73 percent had in the last week uh, used a mobile phone some 24 percent had used computers so you know so um, so this is all hardware and connectivity outside schools. Within schools, there are some, you know, there's a government, uh, there's, a, um, there's a state in India called Kerala and Southern India, which recently invested $50 million and made uh, functional hardware in 20,000 schools. You know, so I think hardware and connectivity will solve itself. We genuinely believe it'll solve itself. Uh, I think the uh, uh, on payer capacity, you know, I think philanthropy is need, uh, needs to play a role in pushing governments to create budgets around software and products. You know, the the challenge in India is that any conversation on edtech is really on hardware and governments believe that, you know, software and content can just come for free. And that's where I think evidence is required to, you know, evangelize edtech and really create evidence that there's a difference, you know. Uh, so I mean, that's a snippet of, you know, where India is. Got it, thank you. So let's let's look at it from the, the other perspective. So um, some of you may have come across a, a book called uh, Class Clowns, uh, which is written by a, a financier turned professor uh, who chronicles uh, some of the, uh, the richest and smartest men in the world um, who have uh, thrown away, in his mind, billions of dollars investing in the education, education technology sector over time. And so, um, you know, as someone who's taken the opposite journey, uh, Matt, from uh, being a professor to financier, um, you know, and who has also seen a lot of, uh, of, of companies, both within your portfolio and, and those that you've passed on, how would you describe some of the, um, the, the biggest mistakes uh, that, that companies uh, have made or entrepreneurs have made in building businesses in the education and ed tech sector? Mm. So... Um we all get asked occasionally, uh, can you introduce me to some uh, superintendents or teachers or provosts so that we can talk about our product idea with them? Um, if you're asking that question, you probably shouldn't be starting the company. Mm -hmm. So um, authenticity, uh, as Jennifer um, uh, called it, um, do I have a deep empathetic connection with the people whose problem I'm trying to solve? There should be a chief empathy officer in the company whether or not it's um, the CEO. Ideally, it is the CEO, at least initially. Um, so a real problem. There are an awful lot of ed tech companies started not to solve a real problem. There are also a lot based on um, uh, profound uh, misunderstandings of or a complete disregard for the science of how people learn. And so I like to ask a um, very simple question. Why do you think you're, at the early stage, why do you think your product will work? And the answer can refer to science. You don't expect a controlled randomized trial for an early stage startup, but you do maybe expect some knowledge of the science of learning. Um, you certainly expect not to see some of its fundamental principles contradicted. Um, there is also a tendency just to start businesses that are one of a large crowd. How many, you said uh, 30 a week, no, 30 a day. No, 30 a week, a week, wait, sorry. Yeah, how many of those do you think are learning management systems? <laughs> like how many people are still building new learning management systems? Yeah, and there's a, there's a real fundamental question about whether the learning management system is the right product for K-12 institutions. I would argue that it's not at all. And it's not even clear that it's really the right product for higher education either. Um, and there are conservative um, uh, shaping forces that prevent people from modifying the fundamental paradigm very much, like the fact that there are a lot of RFPs which have a long checklist of features, you have to break out of that if you want to do something innovative to, to really listen to the users and understand what it is that they need. So if you set aside your knowledge of learning management systems and ask, what do people actually do in a K-12 classroom? What, what could you do technologically that would help them? 
you would end up with some very different answers. And I would point to my company, Apara, um, and Jennifer's company, Nearpod, as uh, examples of, of that kind of rethinking. I'm still curious, though, who you think are the biggest failures out there. And well, I, and I hope they're not in my portfolio, but. <laughs> well, biggest in dollar terms, absolutely not. No. <laughs> D Jonathan Nee, the uh, investment banker um, who wrote Class Clowns, uh, singled out um, uh, Amplify, which used to be called Wireless Generation. It was a big success for me. Uh, after News Corp bought it, they invested over a billion dollars, uh, most of which was squandered. It was then bought by Lorene Powell Jobs and uh, has a more modest set of ambitions. So overcapitalization. Um, one of the cases, um, um, uh, Chris Whittle um, uh, basically had a habit of um, enriching himself um, and indulging himself with the capital of investors. So it's amazing that he was able to raise money repeatedly. Um, yeah, Overcapitalization really was the, the theme of that book. Um, no, you have never backed in an authentic entrepreneur, <laughs> right? So when they fail, their failure is honorable because they're trying to solve a real problem. And also, by the way, the leading cause of the failure of venture-backed companies is that you weren't trying to solve a real problem. Um, so what about from the other side? I mean, I'm going to put you on the, uh, the spot here. And, uh, and ask you to identify uh, at least one company, you could, sp you could talk about more than one, uh, with fewer than $50 million, less than $50 million in revenues in top line, who you think has the potential to be the next breakout company. And, and talk a little bit about what you see in that business uh, today that you think is distinctive and that gives them that foundation to have the potential future success? Yeah. Um, so the company that I'll actually talk about uh, is a company that uh, Jennifer and I are both investors in, which is a company called Securely. Um, and so, uh, you know, kind of a one sentence description of what this company does. It's, it's a cloud-based web filtering solution for the K-12 uh, sector. And the th there's a few things that I think make this company very, very unique. Uh, so one is the founding team here. Uh, these are, the, the company was founded by two engineers from uh, McAfee who had had 10 plus years of experience uh, in the enterprise security space. Uh, so they really understood uh, kind of what they were dealing with. They really understood the latest technology in the sector. Uh, number two is kind of what schools we're putting up with right now, um, which is a lot of them were using enterprise solutions or SMB solutions that really didn't serve that market well, right? So if you're using a solution by Barracuda, you're using, first of all, it's an actual box that you're using. Second of all, uh, it's one a policy that you're administering to all grade levels, which is not something that uh, schools uh, necessarily wanna do. And third, if a website's blocked, that teacher discovers that the day that he or she is teaching that class and kind of can't really do anything about it versus securely giving that teacher the option to kind of whitelist that site and so that they can continue with their lesson that day. I would say beyond that, they actually view web filtering as table stakes. They're going into this and approaching the sector as school and student safety. So they're monitoring things like cyberbullying. They're monitoring things like if a student is gonna inflict self-harm or harm other students, flagging that activity and actually uh, notifying an adult, either the school or the parents. So this is something that's built from the ground up for the school market and is serving that. And the reason why I think they're gonna be extremely successful is this is not a unique need to the US market, right? As connectivity becomes something that starts to spread around the world, this type of solution is gonna be needed here, it's gonna be needed in the US, it's gonna be needed all around the world. And so this company really has the potential to, to serve students around the world. That's great. Um, let's talk a little bit about hype. Um, there, there are lots of areas in the education technology space that have, uh, have gone through its own hype cycle over time. Um, and I'm sure, Jennifer, when you look at the, uh, the, the number of uh, companies that are coming to you now at the early stage that talk about um, some artificial intelligence, machine learning angle to uh, their solution. Uh, it feels like the percentage is growing, you know, weekly, if not daily. 
Um, is, is there any particular area in with that you think right now is just overhyped and that, that really, you know, the, the reality is, um, uh, is, is actually quite different from, uh, you know, where the market thinks it is? Uh, the machine learning, I, I do see that uh, on a, and AI on a lot of pitches now, and it's sort of sometimes just slapped on a pitch deck, and, and it's unclear what the machine learning is, especially since there's there's no data being collected by the, the, the product itself. So, um, you know, I, but I actually don't find that, like, I'm really excited about machine learning and AI, and we've invested in five or six of these companies and they're growing really nicely. So we are, we are big believers in freemium model. Uh, so the f you know, free to teachers, free to students, and then you upsell uh, the administrators or parents. And we have a company called Gradescope that's growing really nicely. It's a machine learning company. Uh, but over hype, the, you know, I think Matt mentioned one LMS. Like it surprises me how many LMSs we still see. And it's unclear what these LMSs do other than post calendars and, and websites for the schools. So that, uh, you know, I'd be happy if I didn't have to see another LMS pitch ever again. Um, then the other one, I guess, you know, just to, I shouldn't, I sh I don't tweet or quote me on this one, but like there's a, there's a company that's in San Francisco that has raised an enormous amount of money. I don't think it's in any of our portfolios, I hope. But it's, uh, it's alt school, and this is one that has like raised, I don't know, hundreds of million on, <laughs> it is in one of our portfolios. <laughs> There's an investor in the audience <laughs> whose partner invested in it. But they're able to raise a lot of money, and you know, who knows, maybe, maybe they're on the, the cusp of, of something big. I'm, I haven't seen it, but they, the, the promise was like they were going to be like the whole kind of infrastructure platform for schools, like a, like a school in a box essentially, and I just I just don't think that schools work that way. I don't think that they you know grab software and just turn it on for the whole you know system to work. There's it's very that's why it's hard to work in in this space because it's idiosyncratic. There's different systems that you have to make interoperable. Uh, to paraphrase something Ronald Reagan once said, um, the nine scariest words in the English language are, we're from Google and we're here to help. <laughs> um, you know, if what that means is we're going to disregard <laughs> the entire history of learning science and we are going to not hire anyone who knows anything about K-12 school districts, public schools, but we're going to build the software that they're all going to use in the future. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, that wasn't the original vision necessarily, but um, yeah. so. Yeah, that guy can promote. It, here's a funny thing about AI. I, it's clearly not overhyped. It's the future of everything. It's the table stakes um, for software of the future. Uh, you won't say, I have an AI startup. You'll say, I have a startup. Yes. But at the same time, it's already being commoditized. It's an odd thing. Yeah. So Jennifer's an investor in a fascinating company. I'm, I, I think my, one of my partners keeps deep sixing it in our uh, pipeline. But <laughs> I have to bring it back. But um, what they do is they, they, they have an app that listens in on classroom conversation and afterwards tells the teacher, you were talking for 35% of the class, you asked 18 questions and only four of them were open-ended. Very useful feedback. So what's really interesting about this to me is the guy who started it was working on a, he has a history of running a, an avant-garde theater company. <laughs> He's working on a joint MBA and ed degree at Stanford. He built this product. He built a, um, a working version of this product without raising a nickel. He went down the hall and asked a few machine learning experts for a small amount of help, and they used existing off-the-shelf open source software to build it. Uh, so the value add is not in revolutionary AI technology. The value add and the defensibility of that thing over time will be in the features they developed that are connected to particular reg regulatory constraints in schools. Um, you know, are you um, uh, addressing male and female students equally? What are you doing with English language learners or Title I students or students with special needs? That's where the uniqueness um, and defensibility of the product over time will be. There's still time to come into that round, too. I, <laughs> I'll bring it up again. I, I don't know what keeps <laughs> happening to it in our pipeline. 
Um, I've, I've got two more questions, and then we're going to open it up to the, uh, the audience. Uh, so if you have any, any questions, be, uh, start, start to prepare them. Um, let's talk a little bit about, uh, about efficacy and impact as a, an additional lens uh, here, which you know, obviously in this sector, investing in this space is something that, um, uh, that, that comes up often, from, uh, from, from certainly from an LP perspective, from an entrepreneurial perspective. You know, what is, what is your lens uh, in terms of looking at, at this particular thing? And m maybe I'll ask uh, Bikrama and uh, Amit to comment on this first. So, uh, so I think, you know, if you go to uh, uh, any system leader in India today who's looking at EdTech, even if you can sort of evangelize and, you know, convince them that, listen, you need to create budgets for software and products, how do they choose? You know, there are hundreds, there are there are hundreds of companies all selling very similar uh, use cases. So I think, you know, uh, in some sense, you know, uh, philanthropy needs to play an important role in uh, generating some evidence um, on, uh, you know, on the efficacy of these solutions. Now I'll tell you the challenges that uh, all the innovations happening for the top end of the segment, but the context of that part of the system is very different from the context of the mass public system and affordable private schools. So data shows that, uh, you know, from our public schools in India that 90% uh, of children in grade eight are behind grade level. Oh, 80% are more than three uh, grade levels behind. Now what this happens then is that a lot of those ed tech products built for students and all which have been built here, they cannot be taken directly to the mass market and, uh, uh, you know, and, 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 and you, they you, the cases when they have the evaluation has failed. This is a good product, done pretty well at this segment. You took it here, and obviously it was just not contextual. So I think you're, uh, you know it's uh, again, if if in and I don't know if this is a, this is just a context of India, but I can imagine this of being many countries, uh, you know, in Africa as well, that uh, you know philanthropy needs to play a role in making some money available for ed tech products to contextualize their products. And then wrapping evaluation around it, because otherwise it's uh, you know it's not as simple as just lining up a set of M&E players who can then uh, you know let uh, edtech products come. And I think the last thing I'll say is, and we you know this is a hypothesis. You know we've done this with a few companies, but why would I mean this is what we ask ourselves. Uh, you know why would a lot of edtech companies that have succeeded commercially in this segment want to open them up, open themselves up for evaluation here? The only reason they'll do that is if either it's a it's an important ingredient uh, for pathway as a pathway to scale. You know, if government procurement demands it, uh, but I don't see otherwise why they would sort of do that. So uh, I think one of the earlier questions that you asked was kind of, as an ed tech investor, what's something that you overlay kind of that a generalist might not? And efficacy is definitely one of them uh, in terms of. Uh, there's three things that we're looking for when we are when we are making an investment, and one is, as Matt said, not necessarily a randomized control trial, but some type of thesis associated with how you're going to have a direct impact on learner outcomes, and why something related to that is going to be the long-term competitive advantage associated with your company. Uh, you know, specific to the US market, I don't think efficacy is necessarily the cornerstone with which the market is making purchasing decisions yet. Uh, but we do think if you look you know, a decade down the road or two decades down the road, uh, that will become the cornerstone with which uh, uh, schools and districts are starting to make purchasing decisions. Uh, what we do as a fund, uh, I think, to kind of support this and, and kind of get this commitment from our companies is we've actually set up a social impact committee uh, that meets quarterly to help push our thinking, push our company's thinking on this front. We produce an education outcomes report that we share with our all of our LPs to show that we're actually committed to this and this is important to our entrepreneurs. And uh, we, uh, you know, kind of encourage and it, it doesn't take a lot because we are backing, as Jennifer said, like kind of authentic entrepreneurs and this is very important to them. But I would say uh, start to introduce them to what type of efficacy measurement is appropriate for their level of company. So randomized control trial might not be appropriate for a seed stage or series A stage company, but um, you know, a later stage company, which is a good example of that is Dreambox in our portfolio. They just did a, a study with Harvard that showed that using Dreambox actually has 
uh, positive impact on the NWA map assessment, and then greater usage of Dreambox actually has uh, a greater improvement on that assessment. Um, and, and that's something that's appropriate for that size of a company. Got it, thank you. So I'm gonna ask one more question and then uh, open it up to the audience. And if there's an extra microphone uh, for the audience members, that might be helpful uh, too. So uh, to be a successful investor, uh, I think you have to be both, um, both contrarian and, uh, and right. Uh, if you're not contrarian, then, uh, then you, uh, what you're investing in will be uh, uh, already reflected in the price. And then if you're not right, you're not right. Um, and so I'm, I'm going to uh, ask um, as many uh, folks on the, on the panel who are uh, brave enough to answer this question to, uh, to talk about something that they have deep conviction about as it relates to this space, maybe a, uh, a company, a, a trend, a, um, uh, a, a, a business model, et cetera, that they believe with deep conviction uh, but that most people disagree with them on where they would uh, actually categorize themselves as contrarian on, on this thing. Who would like to go first? Sure. Um, so there are a number of things that I like that most investors don't like. The investors on this panel with me are a partial exception uh, in some of these respects. But one of the biggest uh, biases of all in the venture business, um, a, a real structural bias built into the size of the funds, and their loss ratios is the bias towards unicorns and decacorns, you know, billion dollar plus exits. One of your questions was about billion dollar exits. I like a billion dollar exit as much as the next person. Um, my fund has had one of them and uh, it felt really great. But, um, and I hope uh, to have a few more of them, but w our fund is not set up so that it requires them. It's not something you look for every time you make an investment. Um, and this is partly because, and I would argue because of our because of our impact focus and our sector focus, we have a relatively low loss ratio. Uh, of our 20 fund one investments, we've only lost money on one of them. So there's less pressure for us to have a billion dollar outcome to make up for the, all the mistakes that we made on the other 50% of the portfolio. And a typical venture fund has a 50% loss ratio, I would argue in part because of the lack of a desire to solve real problems in the world. Um, but also because our fund is sized appropriately, right? It's um, 117 million um, in the second fund. So, you know, if we had a $600 million fund and we were looking at an investment that was likely to have a $150 million exit and we could own 20% of it, even if we could make several times our money, it doesn't move the needle, right? It's $30 million on a $600 million fund. It's not even worth my time as a partner if I need things that have the potential to return the fund. And obviously in any area, there are gonna be a lot more $200 million exits than there are billion dollar exits. I would argue that that's particularly true in education. A lot of the people attracting the most money from generalist VCs are, um, uh, you know, they're, they're investing, um, generalist VCs are investing in people who are telling billion dollar stories, which are often delusional or even openly dishonest. Um, I'm, I'm really excited about um, empathy technologies. So this, this, you know, in the U.S., uh, the U.S. is more diverse than ever before. The graduating high school class of 2020 will be for the first time majority minority. The English language learning population is 10% and fastest growing subpopulation. And yet our schools are more segregated than ever and the poor are increasingly isolated. So I'm, I'm really interested in technologies that help uh, children kind of humanize other, other people and to get to know them and familiarize them um, in different ways. And if you are from you know, a small town in Iowa in the US and you haven't, you haven't really left your town ever, um, just the, the, like what are the technologies that can be used that can allow you to interact and collaborate and engage with others in meaningful ways. So I'm, I'm very interested in, in this whole suite of, of technologies. We're actively looking into them. And, and I think that there could be more advanced applications like you know, having kids experience and understand the impact of bullying and you know, um, different types of hard conversations. And I just, I think we're at the very beginning of, of where we can go with that. 
I don't know if that's contrarian, because in our 2018 forecast, I said I was looking for empathy technologies, too. <laughs> <laughs> I do follow a lot what you, what you do. Yeah, so um, I think given where the school-led system in India is, I think our belief that, you know, EdTech can be a game changer, we, I think, is a bit contrarian. And, uh, but, I, you know, I, I, we believe that, you know, if, if we really want to address some of the learning goals that you know India is facing right now, um, you know edtech will need to play some of a very critical role because some of the most structural challenges we're facing will not be able to solve themselves in this uh, in this uh, in this timeline. And the second thing I think is contrarian is that philanthropy can play an important role in creating pathways for edtech. And in India, I think you know around creating money for valuation, for contextualization, for advocacy with government to uh, invest in the right hardware and connectivity and really uh, almost bet that solutions will come that will be meaningful. I think, um, I think that's where we're being contrary. Happy to go. Okay. Um, let's, let's take uh, uh, any questions from the audience. Yes, please go ahead in the back up there. Hi. Thanks for a great panel. My name is Tunji. Um, I run a mobile learning platform. I have two quick questions. Um, the first one is, I have a very strong belief that the greatest opportunity going forward is in learning as opposed to education. And my question is whether um, you have views on whether there's any distinction between those two concepts or whether you see the two as the same, learning versus education. The second question is related to um, your contrarian view um, in terms of what philanthropy can do. Um, coming from Africa, I don't know any edtech platforms that don't generate revenue because the need is huge. The problem is models to scale. And it seems like a pity to burn equity finding scale models, whereas there is a lot of grant and philanthropy money available which could be used to validate that. I don't know whether your funds would consider helping or partnering with grant givers or helping... Um, startups find grants that could be used to validate models. Thank you. Yeah. So I'm an investor in a company called EverFi, um, which started off with a model in which they give their software for free to schools. It's software that focuses on teaching critical life skills like financial literacy and how to avoid substance abuse and healthy living more generally and how to behave online. And so their sponsors include the National Basketball Association, the National Hockey League, J.P. Morgan, Goldman Sachs. Um, many of them sponsor a particular regions. So the hockey teams and the basketball teams and the baseball teams sponsor within their areas, you know, the areas their fans come from. So those hybrid models work beautifully um, if you are delivering some value to the partners. I think on your distinction question, um, I had the chance to visit uh, the African Leadership Academy, uh, and I thought Fred Swanaker, the founder of that uh, school, made a, a really great point when, when we did have the chance to visit there, which was the focus of the school was not to uh, kind of produce the smartest students, right? And he said he would have designed that school very differently if that was like kind of what the focus was. The focus of that school was he wanted to produce the next generation of leaders in Africa. And kind of everything that that school had been designed around, the entire curriculum, the ethos was kind of helping these students figure out what impact they wanted to have uh, on the continent of Africa and kind of helping them prepare for that. And so I do think there is a distinction there and, and he's someone that is kind of being very thoughtful about that. Um, just may I add to that particular distinction, I feel like um, other emerging markets like uh, the MENA market is also catching up on such a distinction because even though we have a huge deficit within the classroom uh, learning and a huge deficit for tools within classroom learning, but the, the, the leading names in, in ed tech in the region are uh, mostly uh, addressing uh, life, lifetime or lifelong learning and uh, I'll, I'll give an, uh, an example on that, which is Ruwaq. Ruwaq is the Coursera of the Arab world, and they have, I don't know how many, several million uh, uh, subscribers. And, uh, all, I mean, this is just an example on how lifelong learning has become uh, a segment on its own and part of the culture as well, uh, not only uh, stopping learning at, at uh, school level. Okay, 
Other questions? Yes, here in front. Hi, I'm Melody. Um, I was wondering, if you're set up as a fund, does that mean you're uh, limited to a certain time frame within which you need to think of an exit? And if this is limited to, I don't know, maybe three or five years, does that h how does that impact your decision-making process and to your, yeah, the companies you invest in? The, the structure uh, typically is more like eight or 10 years. Um, but uh, what happens at the 10-year mark isn't that you pressure all of your companies for liquidity events. It's that you stop getting fees from the limited partners. But the investments can continue and, you know, uh, occasionally um, as long as 23 years will pass before the final liquidity event from a fund. You, you can also roll over the assets to the next fund and so forth, so. Yeah, or you can sell them to sale someone is else. Not necessary. And, and later on, oftentimes there's opportunities for secondary sales, so you could sell to a private equity firm or, or another big um, firm that has, has come in in later rounds. But you bring up an important point. Sometimes I get pitches where they will talk about the, the exit inside the pitch deck, like, and that is a real pet peeve of mine that you know, before the company's even launched, you're talking about who you're gonna sell it to um, we, we want companies that, founders that are thinking about building, you know, big canonical platforms for education, not ones that they're going to just flip in a year or two. Yes, here in front. Hi. Um, I'm curious, specifically for the U.S. funds, how are you looking at emerging economies and markets uh, from the perspective of trying to really understand uh, the opportunities uh, in those markets while still having an understanding of what the market is without solely relying on hopefully the knowledge and the know-how that the entrepreneur itself brings to, to you? Are you partnering with people on the ground or how are you structuring the, the, um, the, the support that you can give to, to these companies building uh, things not only in India but even in new markets like Africa which is uh, even you know, at an earlier stage than, than the other ones? That's a, that's a very good question. It's hard for, uh, there are other funds that I think do, do it better than, than our fund uh, reach. And so, yeah, there's uh, Michael here from Learn Capital and they've done, over there, they've done a lot of investing um, internationally. But you, you know, you hit the nail on the head and like you have to really understand these markets and the complexity and the regulation and, and to really understand, you know, how to invest in those spaces. The way that the way that I've done it is we have, each partner at our fund has um, about $300,000 that they can invest in, we call them experimental investments. They can be made rather quickly and they don't go through the regular investment process. And oftentimes those are outside of the US. Um, and I actually just invested personally in a company based out of Doha that then they've moved actually to Palo Alto, but the company's called Stellic. And just it was, it was a phenomenal team um, and a great product. They have some, some wonderful traction. So we are seeing a lot of really great companies um, coming from all over. You know, I'll comment on that too. It's a, I, and I'll speak from uh, the perspective of um, you know, our new investment firm, Exceed Capital, which is, um, it does have a global mandate. I think it is a real challenge because um, you know, absent the, the deep sort of local expertise and contact and knowledge on the ground, which is very, very difficult for a US-based firm who doesn't have personnel overseas uh, to have, um, it's hard to build the conviction and confidence to really make those investments and then subsequently do the things that you want to do to add value to those companies and help them, you know, build locally. The way we've uh, approached it, A, is just our, the, the networks of our principles and our our capital partner and sponsor, the Varky Group. Um, you know, our networks happen to be, you know, very global, just in terms of our own own professional experience. The other thing is we've put in place advisory boards and ecosystem partners. Advisory boards uh, consisting of folks in all in different markets uh, who have expertise across different types of business models, and ecosystem partners of technology and media companies that can serve as commercial and strategic distribution partners uh, for the companies that we invest in. Can also be a, um, uh, eyes and ears on the ground in the local markets in, tr in which uh, they exist. 
And so I think there are a few different ways in which you can bridge that, um, that knowledge and trust gap in some cases. Um, but uh, I, I think it is incredibly important to uh, be deep in a local market before you, know, you make an investment. Sure. Um, oh, back there. Hi. Uh, I'm Dennis Misney from the Lemon Foundation from Brazil. And I was wondering how much time can you spend in your funds, like actually looking at the usage of the product in the classroom versus getting the stories about the usage of the classroom in your offices? Like how, how can you balance that and how much, even in the US, not in other markets, I, I figure it's hard, but how much time can you devote to that? Um, I, so I think that's a great question and, and something that uh, we constantly want to kind of stay, stay true to and, and, and do that. Um, you know, personally, uh, similar, to, similar to Jennifer, I, I'm not coming at this space from like an investment banking background. Uh, I was the director of technology at a charter school network in New York called Success Academy Charter Schools. So had the chance to kind of build, deploy, uh, and pilot ed tech solutions. Uh, in fact, the company Dreambox that I mentioned we're investors in was a company that I actually was a customer for. Uh, and so this is something that, that we kind of want to continue to stay true to and, and try to do it. Uh, you know, I will say uh, the stage that we're investing at, um, you know, a lot of that, uh, a lot of that data and, and insight, it's not something that we're going to be able to pick something out of the information that uh, the company hasn't realized because the number of students that they're serving and the number of educators that they're serving is usually in the millions. And so they're a lot closer to their customer data. They're a lot closer to their customer experience. I think whenever they are talking about product enhancements and things like that, that's something that we want to make sure continues to be born out of an, an authentic place. And so uh, I, our role as an investor is to constantly kind of question and, and make sure that that's the, that's, it's coming from a, an authentic place. And for, for us, we uh, look at the data uh, first. You know, we look at the retention, engagement, uh, what the users think of the, the product. We, we try to go to the classroom to s before we invest to see it in, in action in a classroom because we can learn a lot just about being there and seeing the implementation. And then we have a set of education advisors. These are in the, trench in, in the trenches teachers and principals that we, we have kind of automated this process. We set out send out a product, ask them to um, review it, and they just send a form back to us. Um, and then we have just a network of, because I'm from, I'm a former teacher, we have a lot of teachers on our team, um, our network that we, we um, email and just ask for, for advice. Okay, we have a question up front, and then I think we'll um, maybe take one last one after that. Hi, my, my name is Mehul Sangrashka from Learning Possibilities. Um, you talked about devices and connectivity as being one of the drivers for ed tech, but do you think that the fact that you know, we have an evolved pedagogy and the examination systems still drives you know, old-fashioned rote learning, especially when you start looking at developing and emerging markets outside the US, and isn't that the key driver to, to change ed tech? When I uh, was at this conference the last time, I was urging various people at GEMS, uh, and they ended up talking to Andreas Schleicher of the OECD about this, said, why not have a set of standards uh, for, um, and, and, and evaluation tools for measuring 21st century learning? Uh, what gets measured is what gets managed, and right now there is no such standard. Yeah, and I think sometimes products drive behavior. So like a Fitbit, you know, I was using that for a while and, and it, it did change my behavior in, in different ways. And I think some products, if they're really good and they're sort of based in great pedagogy, can change teacher behavior. I'll say um, kind of one of the areas where you're actually seeing that happen more is the adult learning sector, right? Where uh, I think the, the value of that kind of outmoded education where maybe the the cost isn't being aligned with what it results in for the student whether it's employment or, or certainly salary uh, or their ability to pay off tuition or something like that 
I think that's a space where you're starting to see that type of innovation happen. Um, I think it's you know been somewhat difficult in the K-12 sector specifically because of regulations and policies and things like that. You know, as a as a startup, your job is kind of hard enough already, and so you have to you have to pick and choose uh, kind of how are you meeting the market where it is right now, and then trying to push the envelope, or are you kind of going for that um, that that outside the system type of uh, evolution, and if you do that, then you're likely going to have to raise a significant amount of capital to be able to do that. Uh, may I add to that that uh, I think this is opening a whole new sector in the within the emerging market, which is uh, uh, big data and data collection, analytics, and uh, measurement tools. And these measurement tools are what's going to drive the change in behaviors because the results is seeing the results is what you're going to see and knowing one uh, particular uh, uh, startup here sitting with us in the audience that's uh, doing this uh, very effectively here for the region, the, the, the results is what's going to make you change the way you do things. Yeah, and you know, specifically from an emerging market perspective in India, and you know, we had this public briefing session in India, uh, which was before this and where we have where there's no just there's where you can think beyond ed tech, and I think uh, the main messages there were that we need some big reforms, you know, uh, which need to co in some sense uh, shape the demand. You know, the demand side needs to align before these supply side tools are going to get the offtake. So, an example in India, if you don't reform high stakes exams, if you don't establish key stake exams earlier in the system, uh, there's going to be no meaningful offtake in primary schools around tech. So. This stuff has to move together, and there are different actors that need to collaborate. Yeah. Last question of uh, the afternoon. Hi, thank you for giving me this opportunity. I just wanted to talk to you, my lady, about the um, the, um, the that big theory of the lean startup, really, and all of those theories in entrepreneurship that are kind of shaping our brains as entrepreneurs, and really um, having here a deep reflection about whether they are still valid about that whole issue of solving a problem as a startup while there's lots of companies out there who aren't solving problems, but who are doing absolutely great. Um, so, and I wonder whether today um, creating products that hook people are way more effective and way more, um, way more, they're creating way more monetary values for investors rather than mere startups that are solving a problem, um, but that not that do not give a return on investment, sorry. So Just your so thoughts. So is the question that like, is lean startup still valid today or? Um, no, but that rather that we are actually, um, we are having those theories that, as God given truths and as yeah. theories yeah. that we need that are applicable on everything. Yep. Although the, the, the thinking model of the lean startup is great, yeah. right? Yeah. But methodologies as such and following religiously yeah. theories right. um, doesn't really do the deal. I don't yeah, think no, so. I, I, I hear you and I you know, I've heard some very compelling arguments that in education we need, you know, pudgy startups or fat startups, whatever. And and I think that in some areas that, that, that could be be true, but it's the spirit of lean startup that I believe in. And it's really that you are kind of experimenting, testing, measuring your results, and then moving on to the next thing. So, you know, I, I think that's when you, when you, LMS is a great example. You see these, some of these companies get overcapped too much money. They've never talked to their customers. They build out this kind of Frankenstein platform of features, and it's, it's just garbage, to, you know, ed tech. So, I, I still am a believer in just the experimental approach and and really, as Steve Blank says, get out of the building and know your user really, really well and build around their needs. And, you know, I, I, don't, I, I don't know if others disagree, but I, that to me still seems like it's going to be a truth in ed tech startups for, for a long time. Well, thank you very much for your time and attention this afternoon, and uh, please join me in thanking our panelists. I have the honor of, uh, of course, thanking the panel and also all of you to come all the way to Dubai. We have a, we have a special reception for all those people participating in the Tomorrow Zoom. 
Um, it's in the Bazura Lounge. I think my colleagues can lead you to the drink. Um, if you look at the back, one of my colleagues is waving a hand. Please follow her. But at 6.30, we start our tropical night, which is where all the other delegates also join. We wanted to say specifically thank you to all of you, and that is why we've organized this drink. Thank you all.